Anybody like bacon? <laughs> Raise your hand if you like bacon. Oh, here you go. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank some, you. Thank you so much. Some bacon. Anybody else want some bacon? That's really good. I like bacon. I like to cook bacon. I like tofu bacon, uh, cauliflower bacon. Uh, um, making bacon is good. And uh, I like bacon. Who here likes bacon? Like genuinely. Who likes making bacon more than eating it? Keep your hands up. Yeah, making bacon is the best part. Because you get to smell it. And it sizzles. Um, but I'm not really Evan Man. I'm just here to kind of introduce him. He's a good friend of mine. I'm going to put my bacon back. I don't really want to eat any more bacon in front of y'all. It's too tempting, I know. Voila. <laughs> Ultimately, I want today to be a more open-ended conversation. So rather than me talking for 40 minutes and then you guys asking questions, at any point, feel free to ask a question. And if that derails the whole conversation and we, we go a different route that you guys are more interested in, that's cool. I have no agenda. Um, I really didn't even plan what I would say. I think uh, the narrative of my life and just telling that story should hopefully there's enough to dig from. But um, I will start with, um, you asked, a, I have a list here. Um, I can start with the first thing. The first thing is, uh, let's see, my current job. Um, so I went to I went to undergrad at Colorado State University. I studied printmaking, um, and I just fell in love with the process. Uh, what do I do after I graduate? I'm like I guess if I want to make a living and someday provide for a family, I guess I'll be a professor. That was like the next thing. So I'm like, all right, I go get my MFA. So I go to Rhode Island School of Design, spend two years there. It was wonderful. I had gotten married um, kind of after I graduated and before going there. Um, went to RISD and uh, underneath the printmaking program. Uh, fortunately, the walls weren't too high between programs. I ended up finding myself in the digital media department. And so um, I started making short films. I made these fun little stop motion animation films and I just fell in love with the process. You got to play with time and light and sound and, um, and you got to make make sculptures and make uh, storyboards. And there's just a very beautifully dynamic artistic process that I fell in love with. And it was very similar to printmaking where you have to think through layers and think through a process. Um, so I ended up making more films and videos than I did prints. Uh, when I graduated, I, I guess the, the next thing was I did want to move back to Colorado. This is where I'm from. My wife's family is from here. and. Uh, I was tempted to like go to New York City because that's what you have to do or go to LA because um, that's what everyone does. Um, but I was like, I guess I'll we'll go back to Colorado. It'll kind of be a lame sauce career move, but we'll just do it. And in the meantime, I learned how to use this video production software and a camera. Maybe it's commercially viable. So uh, I landed back in Colorado. I did a, a printmaking internship at this at Omi Graphics in Steamboat um, for a month just to kind of transition back. Then I started working at, oh, I'm going to wiggle the mouse. We need a mouse wiggler over yeah. here. Um, I, I started working uh, at a painting and wine bar. That was like number one, uh, basically uh, teaching middle aged housewives how to, that were intoxicated, how to paint. Um, <clears throat> That was like job number one. And then job number two is driving artwork across the country uh, for Omi Graphics, a print publisher. And Sue Omi runs that out of Steamboat. So I developed that relationship. Um, she then had me driving stuff to all these art fairs. And I would set up the art fair and whatnot. Um, and it was interesting. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't the most interesting, but it was all right. It paid some bills. Uh, and then my, through my relationship with Sue Omi, she introduced me to some people at Denver University. Uh, and I ended up, I'm like, hey, I got my MFA. Uh, and I, I think I had applied to every school that I could apply to in Colorado. And two of them responded. 
and uh, I kept pushing the DU relationship, and I, I knew more people through that relationship, and so I'm like, sweet, we're gonna be a professor, and we're gonna make it, and we're gonna have lots of babies and make life happen. And uh, got that job, and um, I was at DU for a couple of years, and realized this is not, I, I just couldn't make it as a prof adjunct professor. There was not tenure track jobs, and that was just a whole shift, I think, in the industry that, by the time I made a decision and put a stake in the ground and said I'm going to go get my MFA to by the time I'm entering into that market, I don't know if stuff had changed, but I had different expectations. And um, thankfully, there was a little bit of an exit strategy. I always have an exit strategy. And I've always balanced probably five or six things at once, like occupationally. Um, and one of those things that I decided to do was start a video production company. And I was like, I don't know how to get into the market. So when I was at RISD, there was, have you guys heard of OtterBox? Mm -hmm. OtterBox uh, put some of my artwork on the back of their phones. Um, and that was started, I'll, that's a different story how that worked out. It's all about relationships. But uh, they, they sent me a $8,000 check to send them two digital images. And I was like, all right, this is great. And this is in, when we're in RISD, my wife had just quit her job, she was working at a homeless shelter, we really needed the money, and all of a sudden this gig came through, and I was like, thank God. So um, anyhow, while I was out there, Otterbox flew a photography company to Providence, and they, uh, they photographed me and did this like artist series like so they could put it on their website, this is Evan Mann and his work. Um, and when I moved back to, to Colorado, I reached out to that company. They're called Harper Point Photography. And I said, hey, guys, I'm back. Um, and I want to start a video production company. And I would, like, what else do you, the only thing I could think of was, like, maybe I could shoot weddings. And uh, so I started shooting weddings with them. They would book, and whenever a client would want a <laughs> wedding, they would uh, they'd call me, and I'd go shoot it. And I did the first one for free. I flew down to Austin and shot this fun wedding, hung out with them. And, uh, came back, edited that up, shot it out, and now I had something on my portfolio. Um, and then I had I did some other work for free just to get more videos on my website. I had a bunch of art videos that were really weird, um, but I don't think that would sell commercially. So I was like, I need to make some commercial like stuff. So I had a Kickstarter campaign that I started my video production company with and I needed t-shirts, so a small print shop, I had a friend who worked there, and he printed t-shirts, so I filmed their process of printing the t-shirts and kind of wrapped that up into a little like commercial for them. Um, so I'm killing a lot of birds with one stone. Um, and I just started to grow my portfolio and started to, like just started that hustle of trying to get my foot in the door. And um, that was, I started the company five years ago in November and yeah, we're going strong. So I have two full-time contractors. We just finished a job with Cliff Bar for the Olympic um, Anthem campaign that they're running. We just finished shooting a, a spot for Ralph Lauren um, for their Olympic um, a spot with uh, one of the free skiers who's um, most likely gonna make it into the Olympics. Um, his name's Gus Kenworthy. Um, and so yeah, it's just been awesome to like have this, this path in this career that I never expected. Um, my day-to-day, -day, I guess I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, is the hustle worth it? That's what I was going to ask, but I think the answer is going to be yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I enjoyed every process, every moment of it, I can provide for a family. Um, I, I have a third kid on the way. Um, we, we bought a house. We're able to, yeah, of course it's worth it. Um, I think there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. Um, I can't just graduate and say, I'm going to be an artist. Like, you have to think about how am I going to provide for myself or my family or, like, what are your goals? Um, and one of my goals was to own a home and uh, to raise a family. So that hustle, of course, was worth it. And I probably hustle. I'm, I don't feel like I have to hustle as much, but there's still you're always growing and pushing yourself. And now I have to hustle to make art. Like, it's easy now to just make commercials all day. Um, but to go out of my way and use company time to, to make something that, that's just for fun, like, how do I do that again? 
Um, and so there's a balance there, and I think the pendulum swings. And in art school, I just made so much art. I cranked out so much art, and that's like all I did. And I hustled so hard, and then I come into the world, and I'm like, now I have to hustle in other ways, but I want to still be in the art world. Um, and then, and then slowly I see like my artistic self like dying, mm -hmm. but it like, meantime, I'm still making commercials. I'm still getting to use creative juices, but it's for other people's ideas and projects. And, um, and now, now that I, I have just hired a second person full time and now that hustle can, uh, I can like kind of chill out and we're all like, let's make short films again. Cause I just haven't made one in a while. And um, I was gonna show you two things. Uh, one, well, three things. The first thing is I wanted to see if that was anyone's favorite picture of bacon, because it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so here's a cool thing. Uh, another, and maybe there's more questions, um, but I have something else. So a big part of being an artist or being Anybody, I think if you're an artist, you have to be a business person. That means you have to be found. And if people can't find you, then they're not going to hire you. So you can cold call and like just reach out. That has never been successful to me. Like I used to run through my neighborhood with business cards, trying to like get people to buy art. And, uh, and it was just out of pity that they probably ever bought anything. Um, but I want to show you Denver video. Production. We'll type in, uh, type that in. Um, getting found is important, and so uh, here's Otherworldly Productions at the top. This is how I was like, all right, the internet for me for video is really important. So it's important that I build a good website. Um, this website is my production site. Um, this is the commercial stuff. I also have a personal site. This is the Evan Man, like the stuff that. Uh, that I would say is my art. There is an overlap though. So we had this awesome opportunity um, and, and there's commercial jobs that, that come and when they come, they, the client is really open-handed. It's, it's rare that they give you so much freedom. But we had a, a client called The Beauty Underground reach out to us and they said, we want you to make a short film uh, for, our, um, for our company and they're basically in the fashion industry. And so I was going to show you guys what a really fun like emergence of uh, of commercial and creative can can kind of make. I don't know if I need to if I expand it. Okay, that'll play. Um, so it's just a minute long piece, and I'll tell you the context. Um, that piece was for the uh, Las Vegas, International Las Vegas Beauty and Hairstyling Conference that took place. And um, it's, a, it's a neat industry and they, they wanted something creative that, that, uh, that people would associate their brand with. And so it was a great opportunity to, to really be an artist and get paid. Um, that doesn't always happen and I've had to really separate uh, what I do for others and what I do for myself. Um, and I think expecting others to finance your personal work today is, in my experience, unrealistic. Now, I know there's a lot of artists like Ian Fisher, for example, at uh, Tank. He's, he's like, he does it. He makes paintings, he sells them through Robichon Gallery, and they do really well. 
um, my, my personal work was never, the objects that I created were never viable in that way. Like I sold things, but I really couldn't make a living doing it 100%. And for me, wanting to get married and figure out other stuff, um, I didn't want to have this pressure of my art has to provide for me and my family. And that just made art really stressful and it wasn't fun. And as soon as I was able to find something else that I really, that could provide, art was now like free. It, had no, it didn't have the tethers of responsibility of providing. Um, and that was something that it took me a long time to really wrestle with because I was set for so many years to be an artist and to provide for myself through the objects I made and I wanted high art to be like the thing. Yes, do you have a question? So with that, then how do you go about like from the very start thinking about like getting all this equipment? Yeah, it's a great question. So I leveraged my art and my relationships with people to start, I uh, basically started a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and I said, hey, I want to produce a, a short film and I need $8,000. And why did I need $8,000? Well, I priced out a Mac computer, a Canon 5D Mark II, I needed a tripod, I needed uh, a light kit. Um, and I just needed these basics. And with, with that $8,000, I bought all that equipment, I produced that film, but then I started using that equipment to, to shoot um, commercials, to shoot weddings, to shoot music videos, to shoot anything anyone would pay me for. Um, and then slowly, as I got busy, I got busier and busier, I just started raising my prices. And I started trying to get those flagship, cool commercial jobs that I could put on my website. Um, I was gonna show you guys uh, the Cliff Bar Anthem video. Um, and I'll be transparent with you. This, they came to me and they said, Evan, uh, we were take, getting bids. They're based in California. They said, we're getting bids for um, our anthem video for the Olympics. And we want to know if you'd be interested. I said, heck yes, I am. Um, and she said, the budget's not huge. Uh, it's only $50,000. And I was like, I was like, okay. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, it, and a couple other companies have turned it down because it's not enough budget. So, so part of the thing of my strategy is to keep a low overhead. And that's a business strategy I have. There's a lot of production companies out there that have a high overhead which prevents them from taking on jobs that would other be, otherwise be great opportunities. Um, and so the company, Otherworld Productions, we don't have a high overhead, um, which if you're not business savvy, overhead means like ongoing recurring expenses that you have to pay for every month. Um, so go lean, that's really important. And with this, uh, with this budget, the small budget that they gave me, I was able to run around for a couple weeks with a little camera. It was like really relaxed. I had a couple friends on other ends of the coast that I said, hey, I need some, some footage. Can you, here's the concept, can you make this happen? And so. This is, this is a great, um, this was a fun project. And they, they needed four different spots. They needed a, a one minute, uh, a 30 second, a 15 second, and a six second. And so, um, and they needed them by this deadline and I said I can do it. Biggest thing as an artist is that we're all, most of us are flaky. And if you're flaky, you're not gonna thrive. So don't be flaky, like show up. When someone calls you, call them back. Like it's pretty, it's pretty uh, simple. And for some reason, artists have a hard time doing that. And you have, to, you have to somehow fit into the rhythm of other people's schedules in the world and just show up and, and be responsive. Like, that's huge. And so when I make a commitment, a uh, very small one, that I'm gonna be at a wedding at a certain time, and I don't think this wedding really matters, it's already setting a trend because the person who shot that wedding they give me a review on Google and say, hey, Otherworldly Productions was great to work with. They were on time. Then it comes five years later, and now I'm doing something for Cliff Bar. That same habit got me there. Um, and so uh, that, that's something I think is very important. Um, I'll show this piece. It's, it's not super long, so. All right.
I. <laughs> that was my other daughter. Um, and so th there's another great example of a company coming to me saying, Evan, we like what you've done in the past. And I showed this some other projects that I had done. And I said, hey, I can rock these transitions. Because um, the big thing was this high five transition concept that they liked. And I said, check out. So I use my existing work to leverage it, to pitch it to companies. And this was a, another project. Where is it? Uh, right here. Um, the Rambo Hotel, which is opening up pretty soon in Denver. Um, they needed, this was a hotel concept. And they, they wanted a website. They wanted people to go there. But we had no hotel to show because it hadn't even been built yet. So the client says, all right, what I need is uh, I want something that shows the f or gives the feel of the neighborhood, gives the feel of our company identity, that, that kind of gives the feel of what the hotel identity is like. Um, and we want it to kind of give also a, a glimpse behind the scenes of what it takes to create a hotel, to build it from the ground up. And so this is the last piece I sh I'll show. Um, and they just wanted it to loop on their website. There's no, there's no words or anything. So then it, it constantly loops. Um, and so listening is another point, is when a client says, this is what I want, you need to ask a lot of questions and give, give feedback and be critical of their ideas. They love that. Because when you're critical of their ideas, it tells you that you're a step ahead of them. Um, and so don't be afraid when you're working with a client um, to, to kind of take ownership and tell them what you think they need. Because most of the time, they don't know what they need. They just, ha they just know they need a video, or they, they need an illustration, or they need a website, or, or whatever the heck you do. They need an underwater basket woven as soon as possible. <laughs> so um, I think, like, yeah, uh, what else do you want me to address? Unless there's continual questions, but I know day-to-day -day was something that we were curious about. Day-to-day, um, -day, uh, what does my daily life look like? I wake up. Like, I'm not an early bird. I want to be an early bird, but I'm not. So I, uh, I end up getting up with my family. We eat breakfast. Um, I go into work at 9. And usually a lot of my day is just answering emails and phone calls and telling contractors, hey, we need the lens kit and this camera over at this location at this time. And being organized, using Google Calendar, being very communicative. Um, and I'm maintaining the website. Uh, we just shot our company portraits like the other day, and I'm really excited about them. I think they turned out really good. Um, but we wanted something that like showed the identity of our company, like who 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 we are, and we wanted something that people would be like, oh, we want to hire this company to do our stuff because their portraits are so cool. That was like the goal. And I get clients all the time that are like. Oh man, we saw our company portraits. We love it, and it has nothing to do with the video that they're having made, but it becomes a selling point. So, um, yeah, I'll just manage a business. I'm a business person, but I'm also a creative person, and so um, I try and be home at five o'clock, five thirty for dinner, and we eat dinner, and then I play with my kids, and then um, after they go to bed, my wife and I hang out, and then. That's, that's kind of a day. If there's a shoot all that I need to be there for, that uh, we'll go do that. Um, I had to run a lens kit up to Fort Collins because one of my videographers forgot one. And, uh, and I was like, that's not what I wanted to do, but that's what I need to do to make the company keep moving forward. Um, so I think being a servant and 
And if you have a team, uh, you're a servant for your client. They're hiring you and you need to take care of them. And um, don't complain about what they ask you to do. Just do it. Now, the other half of that is don't get taken advantage of. Um, and be confident about your rates. Write contracts. Um, does any of this make sense? Is this even applicable for? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sorry. When you asked me, finally it went away. Oh, that's okay. Well, if you find it, if you find it again. Uh, and yes, you have a question. A lot of his videos kind of focus a lot of sound and like cool audio. How how did you get experience in that, or who do you hire to like work on that sort of stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I made my own sound for some of my early videos and then I got really uncomfortable. Like I'm like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I should hire a professional company. And so I hired the company that did Kung Fu Panda, the movie, um, the sound design that, that they created for that movie. They, they do all kinds of stuff. And they did the sound design for my Kickstarter campaign project. Um, and they did the sound design and I was just like, eh, I don't know, like I need to do the sound design. So. I paid them like 1200 bucks to do sound design for this film and then I realized, you know what, I really enjoy doing it and so I just started doing it. Um, I don't know much about sound, I just know that if I have the headphones on I can hear it pretty good and I go through sound effects libraries and I make my own sound um, and sound I think is more important than what you're seeing because what you hear tells you how to see something um, and watching a movie without sound is way more boring than just listening to a movie. Because um, when you hear sound, it like really activates your imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that I just kind of learned it. And it also saves a lot of money because I do bill clients for sound design. Um, and rather than having to outsource that to a sound design company, I end up doing it myself. Um, so having multiple skill sets is, mm -hmm. is another thing, is, is if you can be nimble and, and learn quickly and continue learning. Um, I mean, when you start your own company for video production specifically, you're making the web, at least for me, I'm making the website, I'm updating the website, I'm talking to clients, I'm making sales, I'm landing contracts, I'm writing contracts, I'm sending invoices, maintaining QuickBooks. Uh, my wife helps me with most of the business stuff now, which is awesome. She got her business degree. It's like her dream. Um, and she can have it. Uh, <laughs> but then I'm, I'm, shoot, I'm coming up with concepts, I'm filming, <coughs> I'm maintaining the gear, I'm, oh no, my audio, my lavalier mic didn't work, I have to go reshoot that. And then I'm editing it, and then I'm sending revisions back and forth to the client, I'm doing the sound design, the graphic design, I do everything. I'm this like, one-man band that can like, I'll play any tune, but as you progress, eventually you need to hire people that can do things better than you can, and you need to pick what your niche is. And like, for me, I don't wanna be slogging and editing all day if it's boring. Like, if it's fun, I'll do it. Uh, I don't wanna be on every shoot listening to every CEO tell their company's story, you know, but I did it initially and, and now it's, it's time to, to hire someone to do those shoots. And that way I can kind of continue pushing my energy um, to hire things and hopefully now I wanna make a, there's a short film that is in production we're working on. Um, and uh, that's the heart of why I started video production and got into it. So I'm like, we need to keep doing that in order to keep things fresh, so. Yes, um, yes. What's the ideation process like for you personally and for like your group of people that work with you? Ideation in regards to? Either personal projects or like commercial projects. Like how do you come up with what to shoot basically? Mm. Uh, they're very different. Uh, for commercial, it's asking a lot of questions and listening mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what's the budget. I always want to know what is the budget because the bigger the budget, the more fun we can have. Um, and the budget's generally too small, except in Cliff Bar, where it was like, oh, this is great, we'll do this. Um, I didn't care what the idea was. I said, I'll, I'll jump as high as I need to, and I gave them my full confidence that we can make this idea happen. They were concerned, like, how are you gonna get footage? Because it didn't snow, like, it hadn't snowed in Colorado, um, but like, a, yeah, there wasn't much snow, so I was like, all right, we gotta start looking elsewhere. And um, I had to figure out a way to push this concept forward and I needed snow. So I, I did look to friend, it had just dumped snow on the East Coast and um, got in contact with the, the kayaker guy who put the GoPro on the front of his kayak. Um, 
And so that idea was really listening and understanding the client and then having a conversation with them and pitching ideas. It's like a game of ping pong. Uh, for, our, for my own projects, I have no idea. Like, that, that's a whole other animal because I, I have to sometimes pinpoint these moments in time and how did I come up with that idea? Where was it? Because it continually evolves and I'm not someone who writes the whole thing down and says, let's go make this. I have like this little idea and then I start moving forward and as I move forward, that idea continues to grow and develop. And even when I'm editing and after a, a video is completely shot, I'll continue to be manipulating the, the story and the framework and the ideas. And I, I never land in a place that I expected, which I think is the fun part. It's just this like choose your own adventure storybook that um, that's like for my ink drawings, which they translate, I think the same. Um, I think I have art on here. Uh, these ink drawings that I was doing, they just grow uh, organically. They, they aren't something that you plan. I just start making marks and allow those marks to dictate the other marks. Um, here's a, there's a big one. This one's like seven feet wide, I think. Um, but yeah, so this is one of my ink drawings that I would, I would make. Uh, and people would say, how did you arrive at this? And I think this is very similar to one of my films, more my less narrative films, but um, you just start somewhere and you start making marks and then you make another mark because you like repetition. Yes? Do people buy your drawings? I don't make them anymore. Um, they did buy, I, I sold a few. I, I guess I just got tired of making them. They made my shoulders hurt. <laughs> um, I did, I sold this one in Miami at Art Basel uh, to some guy for like two grand and I should have sold it for way more. I was so regretting that because this was like my master's thesis piece and I just feel like I gave it away. Um, and that was like kind of heartbreaking for me. Uh, but yes, I did sell them. I tried to sell them. Um, it was successful, but it wasn't like got to live successful. So why do you ask? Just a visual artist trying to sell her work, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically I'm curious as to like, because you sound like you, you were saying like, you know, be confident in your pricing or like whatever. And like, I've been getting told also in like a lot of different ways, like, oh, don't be afraid to like do things for free or whatever. Initially, initially, to so get like, something to get going. Portfolio. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, unless you just want to, if that's like your life mission to do stuff for free for other people, that's cool. And then how did you go about, I guess, thinking about how you were going to like price your stuff? Like your video work specifically? Yeah, uh, first one's free. And then I, I did, my wife, this was interesting. Know your competition. And this sounds so cheesy. It is really cheesy. I probably shouldn't say it, but I, <laughs> I told my I told my wife I was like, "Honey, can you make some cold calls to other video production companies that come up in Denver, and like let's pretend like we're a client and just see what that's like. I want to see what that experience is like, so we can learn." Um, it wasn't evil like trickery or treachery or anything. Uh, it was just to know like what is it like to work with my competitors. We made nine phone calls. I think three people called back. One person actually answered the phone, and two people called us back like a week later. What did that tell me? That told me I need to be responsive. That also told me that they're too busy and that they're not taking, like, they don't have the capacity. And if I were Cliff Bar calling them, they wouldn't get the job. Um, and so that really helped me know, like, how can we make our niche in the market? How can, just apart from the work we do, just the inter interacting with us, I want that to be pleasant. Um, and, and that's very important is when people are done, if you made the, the most awesome thing ever, you also hope that your client says they were a pleasure to work with and I would recommend them because if you burn a bridge, like it's like referral work and uh, re repeat customers are the best thing because you don't have to put any energy into it. They're just like, here, here's some more money. Make us another one. And that's great. That's great. All you have to do is be a semi-decent de human being and you can do that. Um, and then you had another deeper question or maybe I just made a big tangential statement, but uh, pricing. Yeah, I think like, obviously when I wanna be a videographer and I'm like bored, like 
do stuff for free and then just start saying, hey, I'll do something for 50 bucks. And then it's 100 and then it's 200 and then it just keeps going up. And then I, I had some really nice kind of basic rates and like weddings were a great example. My first wedding was free. Towards the end, we were getting paid. Uh, just, I was running around with a camera at a wedding. It was a two day wedding and it was like seven grand to shoot this, this wedding. And they fed me, they put me up in a place to stay. I got to be in the mountains. Um, and I found a niche for weddings. I should just show you. I know they're cheesy, but uh, my wedding films aren't cheesy. I'll play this in the background while we maybe answer more questions. But one thing is about weddings. I didn't want to, I didn't go to art school to film weddings. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you that. But uh, I found a way to, to make weddings really fun and, and beautiful. Um, this was, this was a, a good one. Um, and we don't have to like, turn the lights out or anything. But, well, we'll listen to it. He blew out this candle he wasn't supposed to blow out. But I'm friends with every wedding client. Like the Rivers are an awesome couple. They're gonna someday move to Colorado. But weddings were a way for me to practice storytelling. So I didn't say, oh, I'm a wedding videographer. I was like, no, I'm gonna learn how to tell stories. Cause a wedding is the same story over and over and over again. Two people coming together, they cut the cake. And I'm like, how can I tell that story in the most awesome way possible? And so I use weddings for something higher to, to project myself into uh, kind of where I wanted to go and and this started to bring really cool wedding clients this is such a good song I just <laughs> So anyhow, I approached making weddings like short films. And I think for whatever medium you're in, I don't, what's like a faux pas thing to do and like as an illustrator or I, so, something you just don't want to do. But, but if you can somehow tr uh, take that and make it your own and say, what can I personally do? Like, how can I personally develop myself doing this mundane thing and do it very well? Um, that, that I think is important too, because then you don't feel like you're just slogging away doing something you hate. So, is there any other questions or things I need to... I have a question. Yes. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Oh, yeah. How about your copywriting process? As far as securing your work, you know, especially with like some of your audio creations, et cetera, how do you protect your work? Um, I'm not that concerned about it. Um, I have this little thing that says, all works, otherworldly productions, I should say 2018. Uh, I really don't, I'm not concerned about protecting myself. Like there's gonna be people that copy stuff. I found someone who posted one of my videos on their personal website. Um, and I just said, hey, I made this film. You didn't, like, you need to take it down. Cause he was kind of pretending it was his. Uh, it was probably some like 15 year old kid just trying to build a website, but, um, I, I'm not so concerned about it. Um, I, I just, I, I think sometimes we can hold on really tightly to things, that's just in my industry. We're, I mean, everything is here. Now I could see illustration. If you put something out and then next thing you know, you see like your illustrations literally printed on the side of like Nike shoes. That's, that's I, I have a good lawyer, I don't know. Um, but I hold things pretty open handed. Uh, I do know, when I was in RISD, I went down to New York City. There was this huge fashion company. Uh, this, they wanted to put artwork, they wanted to like translate my artwork into a fabric. And it ended up not working out, but I wondered, I'm like, I felt like, cause I gave them a little drawing just as a gift. And I probably shouldn't have, I don't think I need to do that. It was me like kissing up to them. Um, that was stupid. But uh, I was, they appreciated it. Uh, 
but it was a huge, I don't even remember the name of the, they make clothes and they're like really big, but, uh, and I was like, this is cool. Um, and I, I did wonder, I'm like, what if they just take that artwork or just steal it? Because they don't need to pay me. I, they have a huge legal team. I would never be able to, and I, I really thought about how do I protect myself? And that just made me so anxious that I just said, you know, I'm just gonna keep creating stuff. Like if people are gonna copy me, that means I'm doing something good. Yeah. Um, I know the girl who designed the Nike logo got paid like 200 bucks. So like, I would say for my commercial work, uh, we do sign contracts. I've had one client in the five year history not pay us and they went bankrupt in the middle of it. Um, and they didn't tell us and they had us finish all the videos and they didn't pay the remaining balance and I did talk to a lawyer and like we just made a bunch of idle threats that I wasn't really gonna pay money to, it was like 1300 bucks they owed us. And I just said, you know what, it's not worth it, move on. And, and I think that today uh, there's so, like especially with Instagram and mass media out there that like anything you post or make goes across anywhere. And I'm sure some ad agency somewhere can see something and be like, oh, here's an idea. And I think like for you to just keep making the next thing and pushing yourself is better than trying to like look in the past and hang on to those things. But that's just my opinion. I don't know if that's the right answer. Um, that's just my personal philosophy. So. We just have a couple more minutes. I always like to find out like what's next for you. Ah, uh, what's next? Um, I'm making a short film. Uh, Having a baby, yeah. <laughs> Having a baby. Um, there's there's a lot of, I guess I could answer that so many ways, but tangibly, uh, yeah, working on a short film. My goals are uh, to, I have all kinds of goals on many different levels, but as an artist, my goal for this year is to kind of revive the art making um, and I, I, I still see life sort of as a pendulum where you're, whether you're like a vegetarian or a meat eater, like you kind of sometimes do these, these swings, like all veggie over here. And then two years later, oh, oh, that bacon's so good. And, <laughs> and I think like being an artist and a businessman, there's definitely this like ebb and flow. And, and I've been wearing the business hat for like three or four years strong. And that's because I have a lot of responsibilities. I mean, just to, I say we have uh, uh, low overhead, but like just to keep our doors open, it's like $15,000 a month. Just to like pay rent, pay my two full-time contractors, pay my family, uh, we have to pay insurance, we have to maintain websites, and there's just, uh, yeah. So I have, what's next for me is to set up, uh, systems in place that will allow me to be an artist and to start really making things because the kind of work I want to be making is with bigger companies that have budgets that can support creativity um, and the only way that's going to happen if I, if I, is if I start making that work now because if they don't see me making that they're not going to hire me they're going to hire the other guy who's making that work or the other gal who has her own production studio um, and so I think for me, I want to really fight for the cre creative side because it is an investment into the commercial side. And I, I think that they, they go really well together. It's just a balance. And I don't, I don't want to be doing the same thing uh, forever. So. so we have to wrap it up there so the artist class can come in. But let's give it Thank you, guys. Thank you.